G- keep giving it up for Rosie. Yeah, that, she was she was fantastic. So, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and an economics major, that was great. So, that was really good. So, I have to note, this is my first public engagement of 2024. As you heard, I'm a native of South Jersey, Gloucester City, born and raised, and I'm really honored to be with all of you. And uh, Ben, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Uh, so, again, as Ben said, the goal, the plan is for me to make a few comments and then we'll open up for Q&A. So institutes such as this one, the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship, are, I think, not only important for elevating our civic dialogue today, but they're critical for ensuring that the next generation of leaders, these folks here, the students in this room, have the tools to ensure open, honest, and civil discourse, civil dialogue about today's challenges and tomorrow's opportunities. I also have to recognize my friend and former colleague among, I know he couldn't be here, among, uh, but my colleague among university and college presidents, Dr. Ali Hushman. Now, I, when I was president of the University of Delaware, I got to know Dr. Hushman, and I saw what he was doing here at Rowan, and I am incredibly impressed by what's happened here. So, I am president of the Philly Fed. Uh, we are the third district of the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve third district while it's the smallest of the 12 districts that make up the Federal Reserve, it is home to many of the nation's leading institutions of higher education, and this university clearly included in that. And so I think while we're small, we definitely punch above our weight. So let me, though, before I get to my remarks, uh, dispense a little bit of business that I have to take care of, which is a very Fed thing. I have to give my disclaimer. So the views I am expressing tonight are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else in the Federal Reserve System or on the Federal Open Market Committee. So, you can say Pat said, you can't say the Fed said. Uh, that's the rule. So, as you heard, as a former university professor, dean, and president, I am approaching this evening a little bit as Fed 101, with a little history of the Federal Reserve System, a little insight into what we do in the Federal Reserve Bank uh, generally, and in Philadelphia in particular, and to, for you to see a little bit of how we impact, our work impacts, the region and the national economy. And for the students here who are considering their own future careers and are not necessarily economics majors or economics majors, I hope you hear something tonight, whether it's in these remarks or in the discussion that we're going to have, that help you think that maybe your future might be working at the Philly Fed or in the Federal Reserve System. So again, keep your eyes and ears open because I think there's some things that, uh, you know, we need talent and you're a very talented bunch. And so that, um, I really encourage you to think about the Fed. So I recognize that for some here, what is the Fed? I recognize that for some here, the Fed may almost seem like Puxatani Phil. Uh, where we pop up every six weeks or so and we announce our decision on interest rates. But I hope to show you that while that's what gets a lot of attention and that's what gets the headlines, we are much more than interest rates. To that, while I recognize that last week's vote of the uh, rate-setting Federal Open Market Committee, or the FOMC as we call it, made headlines, I'm not going to dive deeply, at least in my prepared remarks, into the minutia of monetary policy in these remarks. That's for two reasons. One, it's nighttime. I don't want to put anybody to sleep. Uh, And second reason is we're going to have a lot of time in Q&A if you have those questions. And truth be told, while I enjoy speaking to you, I'd much rather get to those questions so that we can have a dialogue together. So first, a little history, a little history. We have to start with a brief history of the Federal Reserve System. To understand how the Fed works today, I think you need to understand how it came into being. So for much of the first 125 year history of our nation's economic, financial, and political history, the banking sector remained independent and largely unregulated by any central authority. The first two attempts at creating something we might call a central bank, creatively named the first and the second banks of the United States, respectively lasted a total of 40 years between 1791 and 1836. And they're right here in Philadelphia, 3rd and Chestnut Street. 
Standing in the center of the national banking effort was someone named, whose name is famous to everyone in this room, mainly because of the musical, Alexander Hamilton, our first Secretary of the Treasury and future Broadway sensation. Hamilton believed that the economic future of the United States hinged upon having a sound and stable financial system. And creating such a system, he argued, required a national bank. Now, while both banks in the United States were the national government's fiscal agents for their time, they were nothing like we have at the Federal Reserve today. They were competitor institutions to state and local banks, and neither could set monetary policy in any true sense. They printed and distributed their own currency backed by a gold reserve and could purchase and hold notes issued by state and local banks as a means of controlling the amount of currency in circulation. But that was the extent of it. If you go back, there were individual banks that were issuing, private banks issuing currency. But little matter, as neither bank lasted beyond its initial charter, and the national bank experiment in the United States seemed over by the time the second bank's congressional charter expired in 1836. And it folded for good when its privatized operations, because it had some private operations, ceased in 1841. For the next 80 years, the American financial system was underpinned by state chartered banks and later, during and after the Civil War, nationally chartered banks. But those underpinnings were weak. Absent a central financial or economic authority, the nation's financial system lurched through a series of panics as banks collapsed under the weight of speculative investments, loan defaults and bankruptcies, or the inability to repay their customers' deposits. So after a particularly stressing panic in 17, uh, 1907, a financial storm matched only by the 2008 banking crisis and exceeded only by the Great Depression. So this is a serious banking crisis. The need for a new system of central banking became evident. Out of that experience came the Federal Reserve System, itself a truly American institution, a truly American innovation. The Federal Reserve System is by design one that can be best described as an independent and decentralized central bank. Let me say that again, a decentralized central bank. So what do I mean by that? Only the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System can be considered anything close to quote unquote government. They are appointed by the President of the United States with the advice and consent of the Senate and they number seven, that there are seven slots. Not always full. Right now, we all have we have all seven. But the operations of the Fed are largely untethered to the fiscal operations of the U.S. government, which does remain the purview of the president and Congress. And I think it's really important, because I actually had this question earlier, politics does not, as a result, enter into our decisions. We are in, as some would say, we are independent within the government. We are not technically government. So while the Fed operates in the fiscal and economic conditions fostered by the decisions of Congress and the president, those policymakers, we do not step explicitly into the political arena. Additionally, for me and my 11 colleagues at the district level, there are 12 districts, our banks are independently chartered institutions. That is, I'm not only president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, I'm also the CEO of an independently chartered institution. And while the Board of Governors does have oversight over the operation of the 12 district banks, as president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, I don't answer directly to them in most operational matters, but rather to the Philly Fed's own board of directors. Yet, even while decentralized, the Federal Reserve System has been granted strong central authority. Unlike the nation's first two attempts at proto-central banking, we do hold direct responsibility for the nation's monetary policy. And unlike the first and second banks in the United States, we are not a commercial bank. You cannot walk into the Philly Fed and open a personal account. We are a bank for banks. We are the government's bank. In Philadelphia, for example, we hold the reserves of more than 100 regional and local member banks across Delaware, Southern New Jersey, and Eastern and Central Pennsylvania. We clear their payments, we supervise their operations, and ensure their liquidity to instill public confidence in, the, in their operation and in the overall financial system. But even more central to our mission, the Federal Reserve System works under a dual mandate. 
given to us by Congress to ensure price stability and maximum employment across the economy. And you'll hear this said a lot. That's the Fed's dual mandate. So what does price stability mean? As monetary policymakers, it means targeting inflation at an annual rate of 2% as measured by the price index for personal consumption expenditure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And this is the task we are currently focused on, getting inflation back down to 2%. We are completely committed to making that happen. As for maximum employment, I take perhaps a more nuanced view than some economists. To me, achieving maximum employment is not just about promoting economic conditions through which everyone who wants a job can get a job. You'll hear that often said about maximum employment. Yeah, job growth is important. But to me, maximum employment also means promoting a climate in which work isn't just something to be rewarded, but something that's actually truly rewarding. Put it another way, while the quantity of available jobs is important, so too is the quality of those jobs. Now, the main instrument for achieving our dual mandate is, as you can guess, the policy interest rate, or the target range for the effective federal funds rate, as it's called, if you want the full word salad of what it is, just call it the Fed funds rate. Monetary policy works at a very high level via demand management. So what does that mean? The FOMC will set policy rates low if it believes it's necessary to give the economy a little more gas by stimulating consumption and investment. If instead the FOMC needs to tamp down on an overheated economy to get inflation under control, it sets policy rates high cooling consumers' appetites and firms' investment plans. Now, there are many, many subtleties to monetary policy. So sometimes, though, the best course of action is to do nothing, to let it sit. If the economy's current pace is on course to achieve the Fed's dual mandate, we can let monetary policy do its work and see through the vagaries of the data. Now, eight times a year, the presidents of all uh, 12 of the reserve banks and the Board of Governors meet in Washington, D.C., to review our economic data, discuss what's going on in our respective districts, and at the end, to set the policy rate for the ensuing intermediate period. So we just did this last week. That actual rate setting vote is undertaken by the FOMC, which is composed of the Fed chair and six other members of the Board of Governors. The president of the New York Fed, who has a permanent seat, and four other bank presidents who get a vote on the FOMC in a yearly rotation. The Philadelphia Fed is in rotation with the banks in Boston and Richmond. My last term was last year, 2023. So while I continue to participate in our meetings this year, I will not have a vote on the FOMC. But to be clear, that happens at the very, very end of the meeting, literally the last 30 seconds. The, the voices of all 19 members around the table are heard equally. All 12 districts of the country, a very diverse country, are voiced at that meeting. As a quick aside, my 10-year limited stint as president and CEO of the Philly Fed will come to close uh, early next summer. That means I'll have spent three full rotations as a voting member of the FOMC, 2017, 2020, and 2023. Now, each two, all those were important, but looking at just the last two, it means I had to vote during the incredibly important years. In 2020, as we worked to insulate the economy as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold, and again, last year, as we wrestled to bring inflation to heel, while not simultaneously plunging the economy into recession. The FOMC's most recent decision to hold policy rates steady is one I absolutely support. The data point to continued disinflation, labor markets coming into better balance, and to a resilient consumer spending, three elements that are necessary for us to stick the soft landing that we remain optimistic to achieve. And this gets me to the second part of my remarks, how I land at my decisions. Certainly, monetary policy and economics in general is a science based on numbers and data. We are not lacking in economic data. We have every piece of economic data you can imagine. For example, when it comes to inflation, we have not just one, but two monthly indicators of inflation. The first, and probably more widely known, is the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. The other, which is growing in stature, is the aforementioned Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, or the PCE Index. As I alluded to earlier, we at the Fed look more closely at PCE 
as it better captures how consumers are reacting to price changes, perhaps by substituting one good or service for another. This type of information is invaluable. It's invaluable in our deliberations, especially in conditions we have seen recently in the economy. Even in light of an elevated inflation, we remain strong in the economy on the shoulders of sustained consumer spending. So the PCE data released two Fridays ago highlight the ongoing progress in bringing inflation down to target. The December reading of core inflation that strips out volatile food and energy costs. So you have the headline inflation number, which includes everything. And then there's a core number that tries to take out the stuff that bounces around a lot. And that's the core uh, inflation number. That was 2.9% uh, per year, year over year from December 2022. That's down 0.3% from November and marked the first time since 2021 that core PCE had dipped under 3% annual growth. Indeed, one year ago, the annual core PCE inflation was 4.9%. So it's now come down to under 3 So while inflation does remain target, we are seeing progress. So while essential to our jobs, these hard data also come with limitations, the most glaring of which is that each data set is almost by definition backward looking. Data can only tell you what happened. Data are lagging indicators. For example, it's well recognized that the CPI has long been several months behind, if not longer, in capturing on the ground changes in rents. So that much, that measure of rents needs to be brought into line. Because we know, for example, from other data, Zillow data and so forth, that rents are starting to come down. And so we want to close that gap. And there's a new measure that's being developed of rents that can bring that close that gap, this month-long gap, which is actually problematic when it comes to policy making. Also, I place significant importance on soft data, real-time experiences and observations that I get by talking to contacts throughout the third district. And I recently wrote an essay about this on the Philadelphia Fed website, and I encourage you to read it. That soft data, listening to people, and this is the beauty of the Fed, having the 12 reserve banks scattered across the country. We get to talk to people business leaders, consumers, nonprofit leaders, and we get some sense of the pulse of the economy that will show up in the data possibly months from now. Balancing, though, that hard and soft data allows me to create a more dynamic approach to issues. It can give me the reasoning I need to change my course if we need to change course uh, in policy. So, but for example, about two years ago, I was considered one of the Federal Reserve's hawks, a supporter of our program of quickly increasing the policy rate to pull back on the economy's range to slow inflation. Last spring, even as the FOMC continued to rate run-up, and even as the hard data showed inflation remained stubbornly well above target, I started to hear, I began to hear from my contacts that things were slowing more than the numbers were telling us, and that while monetary tightening was having its intended effect, it was also having a potential downside of impact on businesses and their operations. From our community banking partners especially, I heard fears that some small business borrowers could be in precarious positions as their loans matured and rolled over into new lines at higher rates, which their business models just simply might not be able to sustain. At the Philly Fed, we also conduct surveys, surveys of contacts throughout the third district. Perhaps the most well-known are the Manufacturing Business Outlook Survey, MBOS, or the Non-Manufacturing Business Outlook Outlook. Outlook Survey of Service Industry Contacts, or NBOS. These are really important to us. Each gives us a more real-time assessment of future outlooks and sentiments within these sectors. It gives us a, some sense of what people are thinking about doing. The soft data were telling me at that point uh, uh, that our economy needed time. It needed time to breathe and to catch up. We had done a lot. We raised rates very quickly. And what I heard over and over from contacts is, Give us a chance to adjust, right? Give us a chance to make this work out. And eventually, that started to show up in the hard data. That's why soft data is important. So as a result, I adjusted my position accordingly. I was then considered a dove. as one of the first members of the FOMC to voice my opinion that we had reached a time for us to hold rates steady. We didn't need to keep going up. Although to be honest, as you heard, I'm not a hawk or a dove. I'm from South Jersey. I played football in college. I'm an eagle, man. That's, that's the way it is. Now, was I wrong in my prior support for and votes to increase the policy rate? No. We needed to act to tame inflation. Inflation is a curse on the American people. 
and we needed to get it under control. Was I wrong for my early support for holding rates steady? I don't think so, also no, because it became evident to me that our prior actions were having their intended effect. The economy is a very dynamic instrument and requires a balanced and dynamic approach. And it is this approach that I believe has put us on the path to this soft landing. Now, certainly we have not touched down and we're going to have to keep our seatbelts on, but inflation will start to fall back. It is falling back to 2%. With employment, employment remaining strong and with consumer sentiment looking up. The runway's in sight, but we're not there yet. We still have work to do. This dynamic aspect is part of the job that I enjoy the most. Perhaps because I'm not, as you heard, a classically trained economist. I know enough economics to be dangerous. Uh, by education, I'm actually a PhD in engineer. Moonlighting is an economist. Now, really, there, in, in fact, the reason why I got into economics, as you heard, is to solve an engineering problem. I was working on a Federal Department of Energy grant back in the 1980s, modeling the transport of coal by rail. I needed to better understand the economic side of these transports for my modeling, so I went back to school and got my second master's degree in economics. Regardless, if there's one thing we know about engineers, it's that we're always looking for ways to optimize, to make systems run more efficiently. For me, this includes our economy and everything else that the economy touches, which happens to be just about everything. And this is the reason I love the work we do at the Philly Fed. So we have a lot of projects underway at the Philly Fed, a lot of community development projects that we work with our community development team, with local communities all throughout our district. But one project in which we are currently engaged is the Anchor Economy Initiative. Through this, our researchers are taking a deep dive into the economic impacts hospitals and right here, institutions of higher education are having on their home regions. And for the first time, we've captured these impacts in 524 statistical areas across the country. This work matters. It matters even here at Rowan, after all. This is a research university with a medical school. Because of our proximity tonight to Philadelphia and the inclusion of Gloucester County in the Philadelphia, Camden, Wilmington statistical area, we can see the additive impact this institution is having on the regional economy. We have this data. In this statistical area alone, anchor institutions, so you take the broad Philadelphia, Camden, Wilmington area, these institutions, EDS and MEDS, as they're called, directly and indirectly impact the employment of more than 495,000 residents, provide wages totaling nearly $34 billion, and add more than $50 billion in overall economic value. This is serious business for us. And toward Atlantic City, the anchor economy accounts for 8% of regional employment, 6.5% of its income, and nearly 9% of GDP. No matter how you slice it, these are big numbers. These are important numbers. So one reason I have great passion for the Anchor Economy Initiative is because by putting this impact into perspective, it allows us to engage more deeply with these institutions to tackle longstanding economic and social issues in the communities we all serve. Now, as a former college president, I know that the institutions I serve, for example, the University of Delaware, was not an island unto itself. I knew it had an outsized role in the economic and social fabric that reached far beyond the Newark campus and into the three adjoining states, given both the university's location and Delaware's size. Now, I may be almost 10 years removed from the president's office, but I am increasingly aware of how important these institutions are. And I hope other leaders across the anchor economy space, whether they be higher education leaders or healthcare leaders, can not only see how much of an off-campus impact they have too, but and I know this is true here, you have this view, but you can imagine how their future impact can be multiplied by working with the other institutions in your local neighborhood. And beyond that, our Community Development and Regional Outreach Department helps build partnerships and kickstart local economic initiatives in cities throughout the third district. Each year, I and many of my colleagues travel to these communities to check in, to see their progress on issues as varied as affordable housing and small business development and plan for future steps. And some of you may have read about a trip Fed Chair Jay Powell made to York, Pennsylvania with me this past October to tour small businesses there and then sit down and listen to the small business leaders and what was, what was impacting them. So whether I wear my economist hat or my engineer hat, I think this is pretty cool stuff. This is important stuff. But it also exemplifies the kind of work we do every day at the Philly Fed. 
Our goal is to be an active and engaged partner with the region's life and future. And just as in my former life in academe, I know the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia is not an island unto itself. And our work can't be limited to the financial sector and monetary policy alone. Because we know that the impact of decisions made by the Fed, we have these many, many impacts on our constituent communities. My goal, our goal, must be for the Philly Fed to be seen as an active and partner and participant in the economic lives and futures of these communities. And the best way to find, it, that, to do that, uh, that I find, is to balance between that hard and soft data and to always be eager to listen and to open for dialogue. So, I really am looking forward to discussing with you what, you know, you, what your questions are, but I want to thank Ben, RIPAC, and Rowan University for the opportunity to be with you this evening. So, let's get to the questions. <laughs> Thank you, President Harker. I greatly appreciate the understanding the nuance and that balance between the hard and soft uh, data is really just a, a wonderful image that we should all uh, appreciate. We had a bunch of questions. People uh, registered online. We had a bunch of questions that came in. Some were very similar in topic, so we tried to sort of combine them all. Um, First one, I just want to talk about policymaking and economics. Uh, you know, in your position, you're at a, this very interesting intersection between making policy and the and economic theory and economic growth, you know, convincing politicians to adopt certain economic policies can be challenging. Yeah. Um, often they, a uh, politician will succeed uh, by having doing nothing but attacking the Fed. Uh, you'll get quoted, you'll be able to fundraise off of it. So this became the question, what do you wish that policymakers understood better about how our economy works? What, what do politicians not get that, gosh, I wish everyone would just understand this? Well, that's a big question. Um, let me double down on my disclaimer. These are Pat's views. <laughs> Not the Fed's views. Don't say the Fed said. You know, I think there's two. There's first. Let me start with what I wish about they understood about the Fed, and then more broadly about the economy. Independence of a central bank is critical. Absolutely critical. History is littered, and there's current examples throughout the world of when. Administrations, governments get control of the central bank, bad things happen. The independence of central banks is absolutely critical. Look, every, everybody wants to um, tell the Fed what to do. That's okay. We're, we're fine with that. But it's important for our independence to make decisions. And as I said, we are, we're a completely apolitical institution. Uh, I can't put a sign on my lawn. I can't put a bumper sticker on my car. I can't. We just don't. We stay out of politics. Our, we know our job. Our job. And it's sometimes it's the former chair of the Fed, Martin, famous line, we take away the punch bowl just when the party's getting started. Right? Just when the economy's hot and everything looks good, but inflation's creeping up a little, we start to raise rates. And boy, people hate that. Uh but we do our job because we think that it's important. And I think we, in this current environment, not alone, I mean, the fiscal's reaction to the pandemic as well helped, but we, the United States, are coming out of this period as the strongest economy in the world. And that's a testament to my colleagues, as well as I think the fiscal response, but that's because we have that independence. That's always under assault. It was under assault with the first bank of the United States, second bank of the United States. It's been under assault throughout the history of the Federal Reserve System. But it's something we need to understand. All you need to do is look at Turkey today. They're on yet another governor of the central bank. Uh, they've been rotating through them. They cannot get inflation under control. Uh, you look at some Latin American countries have similar uh, issues. Independence is critical. Uh, more broadly, you know, the 
there's a truism in economics. There are not a lot of the complete truisms. Supply demands one. We can talk about, you know, the sort of fundamental concepts of economics. But there's one which is actually an identity qu equation. It's just math. Economic growth is growth of productivity plus growth of the labor force. If you want more economic growth, you have two levers to pull. This is it. There's nothing else, right? These are it. You either get more per worker, that's productivity, or you get more workers. That's all you got. It's, it's math. That often gets lost, that basic fact, in our, our society today. Productivity has been on a trend for a long time. I was talking earlier uh, with some people about AI and the impact of AI. It may have a boost in productivity, but that's not been proven. Professor Gordon at Northwestern has a book out that says, essentially, uh, the last great productivity tool that we've implemented in our, in our economy is electricity. It was a long time ago. Now, we've seen increases here and there, but we've not seen that... Productivity growth has pretty much been on trend. We've not seen that move much. Again, that could change, maybe AI. But, and again, we'll see certain industries where technology comes in and will have a tremendous productivity increase. And everybody's saying, see, productivity is increasing. But if you look at the economy as a whole, uh, what are we seeing? So either we, either we uh, increase productivity more than we have, or we get more workers. And here, I'm just stating facts. I stay out of the political realm. Our birth rate, we are not replacing ourselves in American society. Western societies generally are not replacing them. China is not, with the one child policy. We are an aging global, except for certain pockets like Africa and so forth, we're an aging global society. So, we're not going to have the worker, so there's either we get more workers, and you're seeing some countries being putting, frankly, pretty draconian measures in place trying to encourage people, and I'll use that word in quotes, to have more children. Uh, and you're seeing that across the globe. Or you have immigration. They're the only two things you can do. Uh, and, and demographics, uh, one of my old colleagues from Penn, Sam Preston, who's a very well-known demographer, he always would beat into my head. He said, Pat, demographics is history. Just watch where the young are, watch where the old are. You'll see the world unfold. You know, you just see. And so that's a challenge for us. We, I mean, I think we're in the midst of this discussion right now. I'm not going to weigh in on which side because we stay apolitical. But again, that has to be solved. Now, there is a debate. You could say, oh, Pat, but I don't care about economic growth overall. I care about economic growth per capita, per head. Now, that's a different calculation. But this also gets into a debate. So you can say, well, yeah, what matters is to be Switzerland. Be small economy, you know, small population, but high economic output per capita. You can do that. We're a very large country. And the question is, and it's way beyond my pay grade, Ben, is would we accept that as an American society? Would we accept that the diminution of global power, for example, that would result from that? It would. I, I, that's not an answer I can give, but it is a question that I think we need to pose. But again, I think when we come to economic policy, it all comes down again to how do we get one of those two sides of the equation moving. And the, the area of more people, there is another answer to more people. Get more people off the sideline productively into the American society. This is an area we are actively interested in, in the Federal Reserve System generally, in the Philly Fed in particular. We have an immense source of talent in this society that is going untapped because they don't feel part of it. They don't feel that they can, can contribute to it. They don't have the resources, the education, the training to be part of it. 
We have a whole area of work that we call opportunity occupations, jobs that pay above median wages where you don't need a four-year college degree. We have a national database of where those are in the country. We can tell you what the average increase in salary is if you can just get a little bit of training beyond high school. We need to, we are an incredibly diverse American society and we're leaving people behind. We're leaving young behind because we haven't invested in pre-K education. We know the facts. The facts are once a child starts out behind, it's very hard to catch up. We know the answers to these things, but it has to be driven, in my mind, by that fundamental equation. You got two things you can do, and the one that's right in our hand right now is to get more people, figure out ways to get more people who are, we know these people, they're in our society. If we could just make their lives better by bringing them into the system, by helping them get the education they need, we'd all be better off. But we have to believe that we'd all be better off. Thank you. Um, one of the interesting dynamics over the last few years in our nation's economy um, was, I guess, what was different than had previously been understood. Historically, when inflation goes up, employment numbers go down. Yeah. But this nation's experience over the last couple of years seems to demonstrate the exact opposite. Inflation has gone up, and so has employment numbers. Job numbers keep going up. Right. So the question is, has the link between employment and inflation been broken? And if there is a connection still, how does the Fed find the balance between those two? Yeah, so the students will know this is our friend, the Phillips curve, right? The relationship between unemployment and inflation. And people will point to what we're going through right now as saying the Phillips curve's broken, it's a useless concept. There's a lot of debate about this in the economics profession. You got to step back a minute. We are in a highly unusual situation. People will point to the 70s. They'll point to the 80s. They'll try to use analogies of history. They don't quite fit this. We were in a global pandemic. Supply chain shut down. I mean, a host of other things happened that were not the normal relationship between unemployment and inflation. It just So using those analogies is just not correct. And so there's this debate, right, that how much of the inflation was supply chain driven, healing the supply chains, there's some of that. How much of it was this fiscal stimulus, there's some of that. There's this debate, I love, I'm not a Boolean logic kind of person, either or. Both things can be true at the same time, right? Uh, and both of those contributed. Now, dissertations are going to be written about what percent of this versus that. You're going to have a lot of work going on throughout. But the reality is, this is a very different circumstance. So yeah, so we had rapidly, I mean, think about how fast inflation went up. Just how, this was highly unusual. Absent an oil embargo or something like that. It just rocketed up because of those supply chain issues, which they're primarily healed, but there's still some residual. The New York Fed, for example, puts out a supply chain index of the sort of health of supply chains globally. And uh, it's better. It's pretty much back to where it was, but it's not exactly back to where it was pre-pandemic. And we put a lot of money into Americans' hands. And there'll be other dissertations written about, was it too much, too little? Again, the reality was the lesson from 08, 09 was that we didn't do enough on the fiscal side. I think the broad consensus is we, we under uh, responded when it came to uh, the fiscal side. So maybe we overdid it this time. And there'd be criticism about that. But we were in a global pandemic. We didn't know what we didn't know. We were in a panic globally. And so I think you got to look, look back on what the experience was at the time. And, uh, you know, I don't have an exact answer to that, but that's why I think, I, I still think the Phillips curve is a useful concept. It just didn't quite apply in this circumstance. Thank you. The, I want to shift now because one of the things that Rowan University has been actively engaged in a lot of, uh, in this region uh, is the emerging economy involving wind power, offshore wind power. 
Um, and according to many business uh, advocates and observers, there are significant economic growth opportunities in our region related to the emergence of offshore wind as an industry. So here's the question for you. From your perspective, how does the Philadelphia Fed incorporate the emergence or even potential emergence of a new industry into its projections for future yeah. growth? How do you... We, we think this might give us 20,000 new jobs, but how do you take that in? Yeah, we just don't know. I mean, this is one where we don't have any data on which to base this. So we're very careful about going, saying what we know and what we don't know. And in this case, we just simply don't know. I mean, other private you know, forecasters will have estimates. The estimates vary a lot on the impact of those jobs. Um, we're more kind of show me. We're more Missouri. Uh, you know, just show us that these jobs are actually emerging, then we can factor that in. More broadly, though, I think there's a question, uh, and I'll, I'll stay out of the wind debate. <laughs> I know that debate well. Uh, but there, there is this, also this, some criticism of the Fed, you know, that we're doing climate science or climate policy. We're not. We are doing climate risk analysis. We have to. Banks all across the country, insurance companies all across the country are faced with unprecedented challenges, risks due to climate. Our job as a supervisor of that, this industry is to model it and understand it. And again, there are some who would say, well, that means you're doing climate science. You're taking a position on climate. No, it's happening. We're not opining on why it's happening. I have my own personal beliefs, beliefs on that, but... That's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because it is happening. We can see it play out in LA right now. We can see it play out all across the globe. That is adding risk that has to be managed. And as a supervisor of these financial institutions, we have to model it and understand it. So I will absolutely defend our work there because without that, I think we're, we are failing as a supervisor of these institutions. You know, having you come this evening has brought back, uh, you know, as a political science major, all of my nightmares from taking macro and microeconomics. Um, Is it that bad, Ben? Come on. I just, I don't, I'm sharing what other people are thinking, but they don't want to say out loud. I get it. Mr. President, many of us learned in our undergraduate macroeconomics courses that there were limits in how much the government could borrow without mm. courting some severe negative economic consequences. Yeah. So in the 1990s and the 2000s, it seemed that uh, the U.S. government debt load was about 60% of our gross domestic product, our GDP. Yeah. Today, I believe it is over 120% yeah. of our GDP. And yet the economy is continuing to grow. Right. So at the risk of alienating my colleagues here from the economics department and the business school, was everything I taught was taught in uh, macroeconomics wrong? Um, no. And should we be worried about the record high levels of government debt? In the short run, no. Maybe in the medium run, no. We'll manage it. But, you know, Chair Powell was on 60 Minutes on Sunday and was asked the same question. And I'll, I'll give the same answer he gave. In the long run, we've got a huge problem. Right. We, we have a, we're on an unsustainable path. Not just the U.S., but all developed economies are, if you look. We're all on this unsustainable path. So we need to do something about it. Again, I'm a simple guy. You got two things you can do. Lower spending. Well, really three. Lower spending. Uh, increase revenue. It's really two. How do you increase revenue? You can increase taxes or you could increase productive economic growth. Think of the 90s, where we balanced or nearly balanced the budget. How did we do that? We just grew our way out of that, right? That's what we did. We had above-trend economic growth. Our normal economic growth, real GDP economic growth, is around 2%. It just sort of runs at like 2%. It bounces up sometimes, down, but it's pretty much just 2%. Um, if you have an extraordinary period where it's running... Beyond that, then you get more tax revenue and you can sort of get your way off. But you can't bet on that. So how do we deal with this long-term fiscal issue? Uh, lots of people have lots of opinions on that. Um, but 
at the federal level, I think we just have to recognize that the only thing that matters, and I'm just stating facts, three things. Defense, entitlements, and interest on the debt. I'm sorry, can you say that? Defense, entitlements, and interest on the debt. That's 70 plus percent of the federal budget. And interest on the debt is about to pass the other two because we're borrowing so much. That's an unsustainable path. That's way beyond monetary policy and a monetary policymaker uh, to say what to do about that. But that's the reality. And so if you want to play with your own model, a good economic model, to, to come up with your own thoughts, your own beliefs about what should happen, I would encourage you, um, one of my old colleagues, Kent Smetters at Wharton, is what's called the Wharton Pen or Penn Wharton, I always screw that up, budget model. You can go on and play with a very good macroeconomic model in a very user-friendly way. To It's a Wharton Pen budget model. And just see, and, and you come up with your own views on what you think should happen. Uh, and I think we need to do more of that, all of us as citizens, because in the long run, we're just kicking the can down the road for our grandchildren, my grandchildren. And uh, it's, it's a problem. I mean, it's a serious problem. And it's crowding out everything else that we can do, everything else that we can do. Talking about the economy is an interesting thing these days. On one hand, there seems to be the ample evidence that the state of the economy is strong. Inflation is going down, as you talked about. Gas prices are going down. New jobs continue to be created. At the same time, consumer confidence has been a bit slower to pick up. And it would seem that people, this is certainly within the political world, uh, we're seeing these kind of articles, that people aren't convinced in their own lives that the economy is doing as better as the stats, the numbers that you talked about, uh, continue to say. So obviously there's some kind of disconnect here between, and and has significant political ramifications. Um, So the question is, why is there a disconnect between the numbers, uh, the economic numbers that you see in your office and public opinion about the state of the economy? So first there's a lag, right, in perception. And what we're starting to see is the Michigan Consumer Confidence Index started to improve just in the recent reading by a lot. So people are starting to get it, but there's a lag. But secondly, um, there's a psychology to this. There's the raw facts of what things cost. But then there's a psychology of walking into the grocery store and saying, why the heck are the prices still so high for eggs or whatever to pick your favorite? That hits people hard. It hits people, particularly low income to moderate income communities and individuals really hard because they're spending a significant portion of their income on rent and food. And so, yeah, it's going to hit them really hard. So their perception is, while you're saying all these things are going down, the things I care about, really care about, is, uh, is not going down as fast. So people, there are various attempts on people coming up with other measures of inflation to get at that. Uh, one is there's a whole nonprofit that has really coined the phrase or really promoted the phrase and an economic index that they've started uh, which called ALICE, A-L-I-C-E, Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed. So these are people who have jobs, uh, but they don't have a lot of assets and they're income constrained. They're not, they are feeling the brunt of this. And so that's why we have to get inflation under control. Uh, but this is the balance. Who gets laid off first if the economy, if the if the labor market cools too quickly, those same people, right? So this is where that balance of policy is really important. And that's why I spend a lot of time with my team, my community development team in particular, has their pulse on those communities, really trying to understand what they're facing. It's going to take, t- it's going to take time. There's, there is this lag effect. You know, the groceries are one thing. I, you know, the, the prices have gone up. The other thing, people confuse inflation with price levels. Right. Just because the price isn't going up doesn't mean people aren't happy with what the price is, right? Because they remember what it used to be a couple of years ago and they're unhappy. That fades over time. This is why, again, there's lags. But how much time it's going to take to affect any political outcome, I can't. uh, uh, Yeah, I can't. I don't have an idea. 
One of the issues, uh, the, the outgrowth of the pandemic was a halt on student loan payments. Yep. Um, this, that break ended this past October. Yep. Uh, as one of the largest universities in New Jersey, Rowan alumni are obviously, along with a lot of other yeah. collegiate alumni, affected by this. So the question for you, sir, is how will the end of this pause in student loan payments affect economic growth? Ah, good question. So we have a very active research program at the Philly Fed, really leading in the system on this very question. We have this whole research area on higher ed finance. I encourage you to go. You can just put that in the search. Uh, we have a lot of papers and, and analysis out on the student loan question. You know, part of it is we're, we're very interested, and there's a paper that's about to come out uh, on income-driven repayment plans and the effect those plans are having on, uh, on borrowers. There's a short-term effect, and there's a long-term effect we're trying to understand. It's complicated. Um, it's not simple. Uh, that, in terms of overall, the overall macro economy, while student lending is the number two source of debt for the consumers in America, it passed credit cards and autos a while ago. Uh, it's mortgages and then student lending, uh, student loans. Um, in terms of overall macroeconomic effect, sort of the broad economy, it's not necessarily big enough to have a large impact. Uh, you would think it might, but there are going to be pockets of that, right? So instead of going out to whatever restaurant you might cut back because you now, or you have to get a second job. And so that's going to happen for certain people. I'm just talking about the broad economy. The number isn't big enough. Once you incorporate things like the income-driven repayment programs, which people can take advantage of, uh, to make a difference. Like what we saw recently uh, in August, September, was a lot of prepayment. Once people realize, uh-oh, it's coming back online, uh, we're going to pay. So we saw this huge spike, the Department of Education, in people paying off their loans. Uh, it's the people who are more constrained. The biggest problem with student lending, the biggest challenge that people face is people who went through a couple of years of college, never got a degree, and owe 5000 bucks. right? They didn't get any economic bump from the college degree, and they owe this money. That's the most challenged group. It is not the person... Who you hear the horror stories of somebody who has a hundred thousand dollars in debt that went to a very good university, has a very good job. Yeah, that's challenging for them, the individual. But the, econ the overall economic impact, they'll make it, right? Yeah, you know they'll they have to repay that, but they'll get there. It's going to be challenging. The problem is that person who just never got that degree and they don't know how they're going to pay the five thousand back. They're the people I worry about the most. I want to just uh, jump back to COVID because we had, you know, it's so unique, this moment in our nation's economic yeah. history coming out of the pandemic. And um, it was obviously historic. From your perspective, how is the economy different as we come out of it than where we were before? I mean, when we would talk about the soft landing and, and other kinds of things that the Fed is trying to do, are we returning to an economy of 2019, 2018? I think, ben, I think about this question all the time. What is fundamentally different about this economy than before we went into the pandemic? Okay, we're working differently. There's more hybrid work. There's more remote work. What else? You know, we're back to buying cars the way we were buying cars. The old lots are full. Other things, you know, there's been changes, but there have always been changes. I mean, we, we're a dynamic society. We're a dynamic economy. There's always been changes. What has stuck? What has fundamentally stuck? From an economic point of view, I, I, I question what that is. I think the work issue is one that's clear. But from a broad macroeconomic point of view, it's not obvious. And some of the data we're seeing that in a host of measures, we're basically moving, if not completely there, back to trend, where we were on these trends that were there before the pandemic. So 
In terms of uh, the economy, uh, I don't know yet. I, I, this is going to have to play out. But put me in the camp of skeptical that something dramatic has changed that is fundamentally shifting the economy. That said, take my economist hat off and just put Pat the citizen hat off. I think it has really shaken our social structure in many deep ways, profound ways. And that's what I worry about. And I worry about the generation who had to go to school. You, you're all in a very different way and, and what that means for all of you and, uh, and your peers all throughout the country. Um, I don't know. We know that that's had a pretty profound effect on mental health issues and other issues. Um, will we get back to where we were? That one's tougher in my mind. Uh, just a quick follow-up. One of the uh, participants who sent in a question asked, is there any pandemic stimulus that's still being released into the economy or is that we've yeah. given it all out or not? So the federal government's essentially done giving it out. Now, states are still spending it. And that's why if you look at the jobs data, you know, we have really big jobs numbers in the last uh, report. A lot of that is healthcare catching up from the pandemic, and government. Governments, not so much the federal government, but state and local governments have been hiring. And that's that money that they're starting to use in a variety of ways. That won't last forever, right? So uh, that will start to tail off and so will the hiring there. So we're a little concerned that right now we're seeing outsized numbers in healthcare and government, a little bit in leisure and hospitality, but we can't expect that to go on forever. That will cool off. Last year, we saw some uh, pretty significant bank failures. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty dramatic. First Republic, Silicon Valley Bank faced pretty shockingly fast runs. The government stepped in uh, and made sure depositors were made whole. Yep. The costs of that emergency, excuse me, are, um, as I understand it, were higher premiums for deposit insurance, for FDIC deposit insurance. And this got to a, a discussion a couple of people asked about, which was, should safer banks be paying for the risks that other banks uh, who take, when they take unhealthy risks, might this not be encouraging risk taking by those banks who won't worry about the consequences because everyone will be made whole in the end? And that's obviously a more fundamental, whether it's just good banks and bad actors or risk-taking uh, actors, and it's yeah. a larger thing. Can you yeah. address so the that? moral hazard question. The moral hazard, exactly. Right. Um, so insurance works that way. The pool is, is the pool of insurance, right? So you're going to have people that use it, people that don't use it. The question here is, did they get away scot-free? They don't exist anymore, <laughs> right? So you could argue the management didn't because they're no longer... Uh, they don't no longer have those institutions. Um, there were, you know, we released a report, the Fed, as a supervisor of what went wrong. Uh, and you can look that up on the uh, Board of Governors website on what went wrong with Silicon Valley Bank and the supervision of that. And there's a host of lessons we learned. But one of the more sort of fundamental lessons we learned uh, is um, it's beyond the Fed's ability to handle it. It, or deal with it in some ways. It's how fast it happened. It wasn't just that banks, banks fail all the time. It's the dynamic nature of the U.S. economy. You're going to have people who take certain risks. And as long as the people who are under $250,000, you know, in their deposit account, which is the vast, vast majority of Americans, they can be protected. That's FDIC insurance. Undepo you know, uninsured depositors did not get protected because they took that risk above that level. Okay, well, that's a risk they, were, they took. Uh, but what happened is we are used to bank runs happening over the course of days and weeks, not over a weekend, right? So this one fed by social media and just the ability for money to move very quickly in the U.S. economy um, was a, a real teachable moment for us that we've got to think differently. Uh, and 
That's not just true of us. There are three federal regulators, us, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and the FDIC. We all need to learn from this about how fast things can turn. And again, it was just, it, it happened like that. There are unique circumstances in those two particular banks. Um, but the other thing I, I, I'd leave you with is, but there will be banks that don't make it. That's always been the case. It was the case before the pandemic. It's all, because the, either the business model is old or management mistakes or whatever, or they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, that happens too. Uh, but it's the systemic uh, issues that I'm most worried about. And one of those is how fast this can happen. And we've got to up our game to be able to respond much more quickly. And again, not just the Fed, but all the federal and the state regulators as well. Sir, Mr. President, we have reached our final question, which we give the exact same one to everybody who gets to stand uh -oh. where you are, um, <laughs> as is our custom. President Harker, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were just starting out? That's a good question. I thought I had life figured out when I was sitting in your seats. Like, and... Doors open, doors close. Some of those I didn't want to have closed. But, you know, it all worked out. I think what I wish I knew then when I was very anxious about what the future held is just keep moving. We were talking about this earlier. Just keep challenging yourself. Find challenging jobs. Find challenging things outside of jobs in your volunteer work. Just keep moving. Learn from people. Just keep grabbing every learning opportunity you can. You know, I eventually learned that. It took me a little while. Um, but that's what I wish I knew then. That, uh, you know, that I've, I've been very blessed by having a great and varied career. Um, and so I have no regrets with that. But just, I see for myself and my children, you know, the anxiety about what the future holds. It is scary. The future is scary. So all you can do is just keep going, right? Uh, just keep moving, keep learning. That's the thing I think I've learned. And on that note, let's thank President Harker for a wonderful, insightful evening. Thank you. Mr. President, we have for you your very own genuine Rypak T-shirt. This is great. On the, yeah, you will be the only one on your block, I assure you. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, maybe. We got a few. <laughs> Thanks. On the back, just to show everybody, workforce development for democracy, which is what we do, folks. So thank you, sir. Greatly appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone.